risk management in construction projects using building information modeling. Okay. Thank you very much for your presence here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, my presentation today is uh, actually a work done in the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki by a former student of mine, Dimitra Vakhazi, who unfortunately could not attend, so I took the liberty and her permission to proceed with uh, what I supervised under a thesis that had uh, uh, the topic of risk management and construction problems using BEAM. Now, uh, let's start from uh, the framework for risk management. So, uh, broadly given, risk management is a sequence of processes aiming at handling events with potential negative impact on a project. I put negative into parentheses because, uh, in theory, there is also the positive impact, but in practice, we're always concerned about the negative outputs of some risks happening. So, uh, we can find a lot of uh, different, uh, well, not very different in between, but uh, with some differences, some variations of the schema that is presented here, uh, including the uh, processes of uh, risk management, starting from uh, the risk management design, which is actually what we have to, um, to do in order to plan and uh, see how the processes are going to be uh, implemented. Then we have uh, risk identification and risk uh, classification. Uh, actually, the latter is not a formal process, at least according to the project management body of knowledge, but uh, it is uh, often uh, uh, used, uh, risk classification, because uh, it has a lot of uh, advantages and benefits for the practitioner. Then we go to the analysis or assessment, which can be both either qualitative or quantitative. Uh, and in fact, sometimes uh, we can perform both types of analysis or uh, either select to perform just one of those. Then we have risk monitoring and control and risk response. So um, we started from the hypothesis that BIM, due to the advantages that it presents, should be a powerful tool for effective risk management. And we're talking about specific advantages such as the fact that it's used throughout the project's whole life cycle that it contains and transfers all the project's information, and also that is implemented uh, in high-complexity projects as well as low-complexity ones. Uh, so that all of that renders a BIM a powerful tool for effective risk management. So that was our hypothesis, and uh, we started to see what more we could do uh, in order to uh, use BIM for risk management, but then we, uh, we encountered the first finding of our research, actually a literature review research, that had to do with the fact that risk reduction is feasible through BEAM, but not only through BEAM. It's actually a collaborative process between different types of software. Uh, and when we're talking about risk management, we're not talking about certain processes of the risk management framework, but we're talking about the whole thing. So what we're missing here, as you will see in the next slide, is the risk assessment part. So. We have also literature uh, uh, findings that uh, clearly stating that uh, BIM-based risk management has not been addressed fully, has not been addressed in a systematic way, and there's a lot to do uh, from that point and on. So uh, this changed uh, a lot our, our, our orientation of that research because we suddenly realized that we have to formalize and demonstrate uh, BIM-based risk management methods for practitioners who are, we know that, we are very uh, far from what we're discussing in, uh, in these rooms of these days. Because practitioners do have the problems that even my students at the academia have. They come, especially of an age and on, they come for the first time in uh, uh, close to, to a, a software that can do a lot of things, but they're not trained how to use it. So one thing is that, and another thing is that they should fully, or if not fully, very well understand what they're using and why they're using it. Actually, these are issues that have been raised yesterday in the industry day, or even earlier today here. So, we uh, started to think of how we could provide some clear guidelines for risk management uh, for practitioners by using PIM. And the first thing we have to do is to uh, 
uh, identify what kind of risks we can deal with and what kind of risks we cannot deal with. So broadly speaking, those that are internal risks, those that have to do with uh, owners, the designers, contractors and suppliers are actually risks that can be managed in one way or another. What we cannot do with BIM is to uh, deal with uh, physical or economic risks. Uh, to give some examples, we cannot do anything with BIM for uh, risks that are uh, their sources, the unexpected weather conditions. Or I cannot do anything with uh, risks that have to do with, uh, for example, material prices increase. But we can do th with things that have to do with changes of design or defective design. So focusing on this kind of risks, uh, we should uh, see the next step is what is the software that we should use, we could use in order to go for a full detailed risk management approach. And the major finding of our research is that there is no single software at the moment that can perform a conclusive management of risks. Uh, and by that I mean, for example, that uh, BIM software, as I said earlier, can help and can support, can actually can do identification, risk identification, it can do monitoring and control, and uh, it can support even decision making at the risk response process. But it does, it does not directly quantify or qualitatively, qualitatively assesses risks. So there we need to use some other types of software and uh, the uh, rest of this presentation has to do with this platform we used. Uh, actually, it was based on four different types of software. I have to say here that this is the second attempt to find a single software doing all the work. And uh, both in the previous one and the one presented here, we have concluded with a combination of software and not a single one. So this combination this time included two Autodesk's products, Revit and Navisworks, well-known uh, products and uh, commercial products, and also MS project by Microsoft and Risky project by Interver Institute. The approach that you can use in order to manage risks with this platform is, uh, is a three-step approach. So the first one has to do with uh, uh, getting the RVT um, file, the Revit model actually, the B model. Um, we were discussing yesterday with some colleagues here that uh, we should uh, shift from uh, teaching AutoCAD to teaching Revit directly uh, to universities, but for the time being there's a lot of people, a lot of engineers out there that they have good knowledge of AutoCAD and fair knowledge of Revit, so most of the plans are prepared in AutoCAD, so you need to use the AutoCAD background files uh, with Revit and then uh, use also some add-ins that are most of the times necessary to get all the details required in the RVT model. And then the second stage is to uh, uh, discreetly from the previous one, uh, outside of the, of, the, of, the, of the Revit model, um, make the analysis through Risky Project and MS Project which are two compatible projects in between, as Risky Project can be uh, an add-in to MS Project, so uh, you can get the MPP file. And the last part, uh, the last stage of this uh, uh, process has to do with uh, integrating the RVT with the MPP file with the use of Navisworks, and then perform the simulations required uh, for uh, uh, examining the different alternative scenarios. So uh, once you have uh, examined one of the scenario, then uh, you can go and proceed with changes in the design and uh, run uh, uh, subsequent uh, uh, simulations for uh, a an, an number of scenario in order to get the one that actually uh, fits the risk uh, response plans. So this part of the process is an iterative one and it stops whenever uh, the designer thinks uh, uh, it's, it's okay, there's a safe prediction of uh, what should be done with risks. So, as a demonstration in Shambhala, we used a easy uh, facility, a residential uh, ground floor residence, resi residential building, 120 square meter uh, area, uh, now sloping ground, some details. So, this one is actually uh, a real one a project. We had to uh, model it from the AutoCAD to the uh, RVT, 
to the B model, and then uh, from that point and on, we had to go out of the B model and uh, use Microsoft Project to uh, pr pr prepare the schedule. So uh, supposing that this one uh, started at May 7, 2018, uh, with a duration of 135 days and a total cost of uh, 116,000 euros at the, at the expected scenario, the no-risk scenario, um, it ends at uh, November of uh, uh, 2018. So this is the case if no risks occur at all. This is the base scenario, actually. Uh, for this base scenario, we use risky project in order to identify for some risks, only some indicative risks are listed in this table, with the uh, consequences which have to do with uh, two aspects. One was time, so they were associated with some relative delay, and the other one had to do with cost overruns. So uh, for its uh, scenario, uh, among a pessimistic and an optimistic one, we have defined, uh, based on previous knowledge or uh, expert judgment, some um, probabilities and uh, some uh, potential outcome of uh, the occurrence of the risk. Uh, the numbers are given here in the, in, in the slide. So um, for the pessimistic scenario, we perform the risk analysis based on the risk project by individuals by inserting first the risks and then uh, setting chances and outcomes for every one of the risks and uh, assigning the risks to project activities. This is actually something that will happen at the, at the third stage uh, that will be described later on. Uh, in this way, as you can see at the table, we can have uh, a qualitative assessment of project risks because this is what Risky Project actually does. But from the qualitative assessment, then you can move on to the quantitative one by using uh, proper uh, distributions, probability distributions. So um, I'm just uh, um, giving the numbers here, which are not easily, um, it's not easily to read them through the figures. So the duration is uh, 163 days for the pessimistic scenario. I remind that the no risk scenario had 135 days while costs is uh, almost 10,000 euros uh, more expensive. And this is again the pessimistic scenario. The same process is uh, performed of with uh, regard to the optimistic scenario. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip the process as I've just described it and going directly to the results, which are 143 days, uh, only eight days compared to the baseline delay and uh, uh, a cost of 6,000 euros uh, cost over him. So if we want to summarize the situation for uh, the uh, two scenarios compared to the base one, we can see that it's mostly about time uh, because if you turn it to percentages, you'll see that uh, in terms of uh, cost over uh, it could be considered as um, acceptable risks. But in terms of time, the situation might be a little bit different. This is something that the uh, contractor has to uh, think of. Now, what is uh, very important is how you uh, combine, how you marry the results from the output uh, of uh, MS and the risky project softwares with uh, Revit, with the B model. Now, what is needed here is first of all an intermediate an interface, and this one is Navisworks that can perform 4D simulations. And uh, one other thing is to uh, connect the tasks, its task with its object of the model. So uh, the highlighted variable is an added variable, which has actually to do this uh, uh, connection between the different types of, uh, of files. So from MS project and Risky project, through an added variable to Navisworks, you can go to uh, the Navisworks, uh, um, to the Revit um, model and perform simulations for different scenario. Um, I'm glad that I avoided to use uh, the video and I'm having just instances for that where you can see the 4D simulations in Navisworks in different time uh, periods at uh, the no risk, pessimistic and optimistic scenario. Well, it is quite clear that uh, we have a certain differences based on the tasks that are uh, delayed. And uh, 
the, 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 the idea is that by having the real model connected with the tasks, whenever you can uh, change the tasks by uh, resource leveling or by um, any other way, uh, crossing schedules or whatever, you can, or even changes to the design, you can actually examine different scenarios, rerun them, and see uh, what is the effect of those changes that you have to do. And at the same time, having the very specific uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative assessments of the, the risks that you have studied. So, in terms of conclusions, the advantages of this uh, approach, so to say, or, or methodology, um, it is that uh, it is uh, quite easy to apply. It does not require uh, um, a very uh, sophisticated knowledge, so that makes it, uh, that renders it uh, good for practitioners. Uh, it's uh, uh, applicable for all types of projects. Um, it, can, uh, uh, it can examine different uh, kind of scenarios and a great number of them. And uh, there are no, uh, or at least there are considerably reduced uh, time scenarios while transferring data. On the other hand, there are also some disadvantages. Uh, the uh, most important to feel is that uh, not all risks uh, can be uh, treated. There are a lot of risks that are left outside because there is a, a shortage of the tools. The other fact is that not all risks can be assigned to uh, the model objects the model's objects, and uh, of course, what was the original intention is still uh, something that we have not reached to fully automate the risk management process through BIM. That's something that we need to do, and maybe uh, the um, uh, ideas and uh, research path towards semantics that were uh, discussed earlier today uh, have to do with that. Um, this is an, it's an open field for research. And of course, we have to check about, always we have to check about software incompatibilities. We have chosen in this case uh, software that are really compatible in between, which is not the case with all the types of software available in the market. So I'd like to thank you for your attendance and um, I'll be glad to discuss if there are any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Thank you.